Good afternoon from the Corning Museum of Glass here in the Finger Lakes area of New York, Corning, New York to be specific. Um, today we're going to look at uh, a little behind the scenes work with our conservation department, but we're also going to take a peek into the galleries as well. Um, we are going to look at four threads that conservationists here at the museum um, deal with. They're not the only ones, but they're the ones for focus for today. Uh, one is going to be the particular issues that archaeological glass deals with, or that we deal with, with dealing with archaeological glass. Then also, uh, we're going to be looking at objects with sensitive surfaces, and uh, also objects that have already uh, been repaired, and how do you uh, work in the present with things that have been repaired in the past. And then finally, the unique uh, issues that we deal with when we kind of work on preserving our contemporary collection. So there's a lot con conservationists have to think, or conservators have to think about here at the museum when your collection goes back 3,500 years to the present. So, uh, and the people who are going to be guiding us today are over here to my right. Uh, Steve Koob is our chief conservator. Um, Astrid Van Geffen is our associate conservator, and Leanne Usato is our assistant conservator. And I'm actually going to turn it over to Steve now to get us started. Thank you, Troy. Uh, I'd first like to just welcome um, our viewers and say that um, some of you probably were, saw this uh, live stream we did in January. Welcome back. And for new viewers, welcome to our conservation lab. So we are going to start with archaeological glass. And we'll start with a look at some glass in the galleries. So our 35 centuries of glass starts with uh, the earliest glass we have in the collection, the ancient glass. And uh, the second case, as you walk through the gallery, is Roman glass. And we're going to focus specifically on this one figurine here, where you can see what we call weathering, is heavy, uh, thick layers of, of um, weathering on the glass. They actually are formed from archaeological burial. And it takes several thousand years for that kind of thickness to develop. And it, it's caused primarily by the, the piece being buried in an environment that has a lot of water seasonally. Uh, these layers develop because the, uh, the, the soluble components of the glass are leached out and leaving behind multiple, not multiple, hundreds sometimes, layers of silica that, that form with this weathering crust or weathering layers. Um, so it is the type of deterioration. Uh, we have some examples here in the lab that I want to also focus on and show you what we mean by that. So here's another piece very similar to the one in the gallery. Uh, it has what we call opalescent weathering on it. And you can see it has very thick areas as well, that are some of which have been lost. Uh, and it preserves the original surface of the glass because this weathering starts from the outside in. And because it starts from the outside in, you, it, it covers up the uh, um, original glass. So I think you can probably see the color of this glass is a transparent yellow-green or greenish um, clear glass, similar to the piece that we saw on display. Um, this weathering is, can be protective, but it, it develops over time. And depending on the thickness of the weathering, you get different imaging effects. So also on the table here, we have some thinner layers where you see that the glass is what we call iridescent. Iridescent comes from the uh, goddess of the rainbow, Iris, the Greek goddess of the rainbow. And we call this kind of opaque weathering um, opalescent weathering because it almost looks like the color of an opal. So it can be different thicknesses. They can, uh, uh, see even on the same piece of glass, and um, it manifests itself depending on how the glass was buried in the, in the archaeological environment. Can I ask a question here? So I, it took me a while when I first started working here to realize that um, things like the female figure we saw in the video earlier weren't actually this kind of alabaster or kind of creamy color. Um, and I love the video because it gets you so close and you can actually see what the original color of the glass is. Um, 
what are the kinds of things that visitors need to look for? And I always tell visitors to get a lot closer than they think they need to get uh, to the cases to see the th all that they can see in a glass object. Um, what would be some of the signs that they would want to look for to figure out whether or not they're looking at a weathered piece or not from an archaeological dig? Well, I think some of it is just the surface appearance. Um, and a, there's a word of caution here that some of these thinner layers or layers that are not well adhered are very sensitive to handling. So what you're looking at on this piece here specifically is you're looking at mostly glass. The weathering has been actually lost either during burial or post burial, possibly by over cleaning. Uh, early archaeologists loved to look at the color of the glass. They wanted to see the color, the transparency of the glass, and so they would remove the weathering. We now don't do that because we know that it preserves even the finest of finest details, like this little thread that goes all around the outside. So handling it, it gets to be an issue. You want to look for a solid area to handle the piece with. You also want to respect the fact that these, these weathering areas are difficult to handle. So if what had happened to this piece where they took, they took the weathering off had happened to this piece, that, th that fine thread of glass would not be there necessarily. Correct. Okay. Correct. Hmm. And we're going to uh, actually take a close-up look at uh, a, a piece of heavily weathered glass that will show you some of these details on the screen. So this is Astrid, and she's going to explain what she's looking at. So I'm looking at a little mold-blown bottle, Roman mold-blown bottle. Um, and if we look at the microscope view, um, we can see that there are multiple layers. So the kind of creamy color that you see is the original surface, and then the deterioration goes from that surface inward. So as Steve was saying, when we lose that surface, we lose the original surface. Um, and you can see kind of those bluish areas um, the reason that there, there's these white speckles all over is because it's actually very pitted and you can see um, all the, ma the, the many layers in this image as well. If we zoom in a little closer. That is quite a microscope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can really see all the different layers um, that, in, that have been partially lost, but we still have some of the original. So Esther, you're well. saying that the creamy kind of pinkish looking layer is original glass. Yes. But that the color itself would have looked like what's deeper inside the glass? Yes. That bluish color? Yeah, so the, the, the original glass color was actually blue, but because the composition of the surface has changed, um, what you see is uh, the, the original surface that's preserved is now a different color. So it's not that anything's being added to the surface of the no. glass. Like, the, like if a piece of metal oxidizes and we call that patina, you know, where it kind of develops a cloudy film on the outside. Right, right. So with metals, uh, when they deteriorate, the, the deterioration builds up on top of the original surface. With glass, when it deteriorates, the original surf surface stays the same and the deterioration goes into the glass. And so the, see the glass is the blue, the iridescence is a layer of weathering. Yeah. And then you know, these other kind of looks like, it's almost like you're looking down into a canyon are kind of the piece, the layers right, of right. glass that are, have different kinds of weathering on them. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. And you can see where, where the, that weathering has been removed, you get this really pitted surface. So that is maybe what, an argument for perhaps not removing the weathering is that it changes the surface of the glass? Exactly, and as Steve was saying earlier, like that thin trail, details like that and um, you know tool marks and things like that would would be lost if you remove okay. the surface all right let's go back to steve well do we have any questions from our audience yet i don't know do we have questions from our audience yet not yet not yet so i just would like to wrap up the archaeological glass examination with saying that we, we actually have pieces uh, many pieces that are in excellent condition, almost like they were made yesterday, with no weathering whatsoever. And why is that? It's because those pieces were buried in a very friendly environment, in the absence of water. Water is the, again, the kind of difficult problem here. It's, it, it leaches out the soluble components from the glass. 
It also leaches out the colorants, so that's why you lose that blue color on the piece that Astrid was just looking at. And you're just left behind with these layers of silica. So that's one of the things you also have to be aware of. So the difference between what we're looking at now and what we're about to look at with Astrid is that these all would have been underground or buried in some way beforehand. Is that correct? Correct. Correct. Okay. And probably a water environment seasonally, for example, most of the Mediterranean area gets rains in the winter and so and then they dry out in the summer. And so the seasonal rain uh, every year, or every couple of years is probably going to form a, no, a new layer of this weathering. Hmm. Okay. All right. Can we move to the front center, sir? So, then we're going to go next back up into the galleries and we're going to look at uh, the sensitive surfaces in the modern gallery. Uh, so here, you'll be walking into our section of the modern gallery, which is where we have our large collection of Lalique. And Lalique is a, you know, certainly a very well-known glass producer from France. Uh, we have a very large collection. What's interesting about these is that almost all the surfaces are acid etched. And because they're acid etched, they're again very sensitive to handling, especially handling by damp, wet hands. And these are further complicated by the fact of what you just saw, the colors that are on the surface. The colors on the surface are actually pigments. And we're going to look at some details here in the lab that mimic those uh, that are that are in the galleries to show you what I mean. So, and for this reason, I'm going to put on gloves because I don't want to get my, my fingers on these. One, the oils and salt from your fingers are probably going to leave an almost indelible mark on the acid etched glass and or they may remove some of the pigment. So, we tend to wear nitrile gloves and I did not mention gloves for the archaeological glass because we prefer not handling the archaeological glass with gloves because you get a better feel for the surface and and uh, contact with the piece. So just in terms of people who may own glass at this point, if they have acid etched glass in their collections, general rule of thumb is don't handle it on the places that were acid etched because they're going to be kind of fingerprint managed. Correct. Magnets, okay. Correct, Troy. Uh, interestingly, a lot of the leak is not acid etched on the interiors or underneath. So that you actually probably could maybe just wear one glove and handle the inside with your hands. But the outside, I would definitely wear gloves for handling this. So these are, these are pigments that are rubbed into the acid etch surface to give you the decoration, have the decoration stand out. And without it, it would be a very dull appearing light shade. Um, this goes to a lamp. And um, so we really need to be careful in the handling of this. Similarly, we have an, a piece just like the one in the galleries, which again, the decorative scheme of the uh, on the sides here is is made specifically to be colored um, so that everywhere that there's a, a deep application of the pigment you have a deep darker area of decoration and then the lighter areas are um, lighter so it gives you a, a significant contrast on the surface of the glass again the interior since technically they were allowed to be used these this would have held you know probably it's a decanter so it could have been you know, wine or um, some kind of liqueur uh, and certainly could have been used. But again, handling here is the real issue. And um, as with before, we're going to take a close-up look at, at uh, a, a piece, again, similar to the one that's in the gallery with blue colorants okay. on the surface. So we're going to look at the wing of this butterfly. And I have this pulled up on the microscope. So... So we can see the, um, the pitted texture of the surface. That's from the acid etching. And you can, uh, you can see where the pigment, the blue pigment, um, is kind of stuck in those textured little places. And the acid didn't get to those spots, is um, that correct? It would have been acid etched probably before the pigment was applied. Ah, OK. So that pigment's just sitting right on the surface. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. so, so I'll send it back over to yeah. Steve for. Thank you, Leanne. Um, I think that's a good example also of probably one a piece that may have been overhandled. And because it was overhandled 
from the high areas or the ridges of the decorative pattern, it's been, it's been worn off. Uh, one of the things we certainly avoid, again, with, with not just handling these pieces, is cleaning. Is we certainly do not expose them to water or to liquids that, again, might remove the pigmentation. Is that specifically with acid etched, or are there other kind of surface etching treatments that you would not use water on? It, it, it could be more um, things that are sandblasted, which gives you a similar effect on the surface of very, you know, kind of pitted microscopically surface, are also extremely sensitive to, to handling. Um, those are the main ones, and we'll discuss a couple others okay. in, in, as we go along. Well, one is, um, is actually right here, is an iridized piece. We call this iridized because it's, uh, it, it again comes back to the fact that this gives you kind of this rainbow effect as you shine light on it. Uh, this, this was made by Frederick Carter. Sorry, this is a Tiffany piece, but this is also done by, uh, uh, similarly done by Frederick Carter and, and um, many other artists. The, uh, they were especially interested in reproducing the iridized look of archaeological glass. This was very popular in what's called the antiquarian period, which was the mid-19th century, when archaeology started out in, in the Mediterranean and it got into the news. Uh, the Egyptian tombs were excavated. Uh, Schliemann was excavating in Greece. And all this archaeological glass started coming on the market. And so people were collecting glass, and then modern artists were trying to imitate that surface because people loved it so much. Again, this iridized, it's a metallic surface. It's called, caused by spraying glass while it's still hot with tin oxide, and it gives you this wonderful, lustrous, iridized So even surface. though it looks very similar to the iridized surface of the, the bowl over here, Completely different processes, Com completely different reactions on the surface. Completely different, completely different, um, uh, but exploited extensively by, by people like Tiffany who like to layer it mm -hmm. also for some of his stained glass windows with other types of colored glass. So you have multiple layers and lots of light bouncing around and giving you different effects. So what they have in common, it may be just the layers and the way the light goes through those layers is what's producing the iridization. Co right? Correct, okay. correct. Uh, but again, very sensitive to handling with, right. with bare hands. I have a couple of questions from our audience. Uh, one is related to the archaeological pieces. Uh, can pieces from the same archaeological site have different types of weathering? Indeed, they can. Um, as a matter of fact, pieces from uh, even the same piece can have different weathering on it. I think as you can see on, on some of these pieces, there's a very thin amount of weathering on this little, little jug. Um, but it, again, also sets off some of the decoration and, and the inscription that's on this. But if you look at the, the bottle or even this piece, you see that there's, there's certain amounts of, um, I'm not gonna take my gloves off for this, but um, I probably should, is you'll see that there you actually have completely well-preserved glass, really still shiny in certain areas that didn't get weathered. So it may have somehow been protected in burial Maybe it was close up against uh, some clay or something that prevented water from leaching out um, the surface. But we can get you know, very many different appearances even on the same glass. So we may be thinking of microclimates being kind of specific to a burial site, but there are actually multiple micro-microclimates within a burial or even within a, a Correct. particular climate. Correct. Interiors often will weather differently than exteriors. Ah, okay. Uh, and then another question uh, related to the application of pigments. What kind of pigments are used in coloring acid etched glass? I think in, in almost all cases, they're, they're natural earth pigments. Um, they like the special effect of uh, you know, an ochre or uh, iron oxide. Uh, you know, some of the black pigments, uh, we have not had them analyzed, but um, I'm sure that's something um, somebody could do a wonderful research project on, yeah, is the blacks could that. be anything <laughs> from, from um, I would guess, uh, carbon black to, I'm not sure what else would be using, using for black. Any ideas? But, yeah, it's um, usually carbon based. Yeah, mostly, mostly probably carbon based, so natural, natural uh, uh, pigments. So those are peacocks that we're looking at on that lampshade, right? I do believe they are. Yeah. And so. is the color, 
and I'm assuming that's not a recent piece. Um, I could be wrong, I guess. Is that color the way it would have looked as far as we know, kind of when it was created, or has it actually weathered? I think this one's actually quite well preserved. Okay. And I think it would have looked very similar to this. Might have been just a tiny bit darker. As I, you assume that people generally clean their collections in, mm -hmm. some, ha in some way, um, either if they've been on the, in, in their home on display for you know decades, you dust them, even probably dusting is likely to, even with a very soft brush or uh, feather duster, would possibly even remove a little bit of pigment. And you can see kind of where the peacock's body is, that it's a little bit lighter uh -huh. um, in, in these areas. Towards the neck. Yeah, so it, it may have been rubbed off a little bit. Yeah. Well, that kind could, of where, yeah. where it was handled more. Yeah, very likely, yeah. Great. What's next? All right, well, I'm going to uh, talk about a few more sensitive surfaces. So this piece right here um, has been decorated with what we call cold painting. So the, the decoration that you see was just painted on after the glass was made. And as you can see, it's very fragile. Not a lot of things like the stick to glass. So things like cold painting, um, uh, we have to be more careful with when we're handling and we basically avoid handling, touching those areas um, because it is more sensitive. And the same thing goes for gilding. So this goblet has some gilding on it. It's in fairly good condition, but um, some of the other gilded pieces that we see and we can see here, there's a little bit of loss of gilding in there. I don't know if you can see that. One of our visitors has a question, I think, that relates to what you've just been talking about. Um, is washing dangerous to painted pieces that have been fired to make the decoration? Okay, so that's, um, that's called enameling. And we actually have another piece over here, which I was going to talk about later, but um, this has enameling on it, and um, that's actually fused to the glass. So it's pretty stable, and you can wash that um, carefully. Um, unlike the cold painted, which is, um, you know, can create similar designs, but it's not adhered to the surface as well as enamel. And then going back to the desert, um, <laughs> this uh, viewer says, I have found glass in the desert that turned purple. Is that a reaction between light and metals or other elements in the glass or a reaction to chemicals in the ground? Well, that's actually a reaction with light and the glass itself. So a lot of colorless glass has manganese in it, which is used to decolorize. Um, so a lot of glass has minor impurities, which will cause it to turn green or so, and the manganese is added in there to counteract that green. Um, but the sun changes the oxidation state of the manganese, which turns it purple. So it's, if you put um, a colorless glass outside long enough, it'll turn purple. Hmm. So that's a, li a little different from what we're talking about and right now. But There's also some good examples of that in, in our cities, which are now 200 yeah. years old plus. Boston especially, some of the old globes that were still on the streetlights have turned purple over the years. <laughs> the glass and the pavements that are above the, the storage areas uh, outside of shops and things have turned purple. They were originally clear. It, this is a phenomenon that's called solarization. And it got to be so popular, I think in the 60s, that people were actually taking carloads of glass out to the desert, leaving them for a few years, and then bringing them back and selling them on eBay. <laughs> so if you see purple glass, don't, don't automatically assume it, it was, was originally purple. Correct. OK. Correct. Mm -hmm. And you cannot reverse it. So we can't take it back from the purple to the clear glass. So it's an irreversible process. One more sensitive type of glass, and we do have lots of these in the collections, is glass that's covered with metal or partially covered with metal. I mean, you often see this on decanters with metal handles or um, bases um, that are made of silver or rims that are silver. In this case, we have uh, the glass almost completely covered by a silver uh, decorative network here um, that is tarnished partially, but is also, again, silver is very sensitive to your to touching and to tarnishing. It's again, your fingers have salt in them um, and also just naturally a lot of the air that surround us has some sulfur in it. And so these are very likely to turn the, um, the silver um, to a, a, a gray or um, even black in some cases. Uh, we don't routinely clean our silver because every time you clean it, 
you are removing some silver. So if we polish this every few years, it would look better, yes, but um, in most cases we do that for some of the pieces on display, but we don't do it for every piece in the collection. But um, we, we again, be, just be very careful in handling this, again, wearing the gloves, nitro gloves, so that you're not getting, uh, you know, damp fingerprints or salt on the, on the, uh, on the metal as well. Does the metal casing uh, affect or attract or trap moisture in any way, or is it always kind of just far enough away that it doesn't do that? No, it's not a question of far away or anything. It's just, you know, metals tend to, tend to not be so reactive. Although we have seen in the case of some, some copper fittings and copper things that it actually, in a high humidity environment, it will actually interact with the, uh, uh, the moisture will interact with the copper, causing it to corrode a little bit. The corroding of the copper then can kind of actually affect the glass. Okay. And there's so some research being done on that and trying to understand the, the, um, the, the parameters of, of that. Great. All right, so there are also some other places where we see glass um, on, or glass with metal and we'll take a, a look at um, up in the galleries. Uh, this giant punch bowl in the Crystal City Gallery um, was one of the largest of its kind um, and we see that it was so important uh, because there, there are, there's actually an old repair on this. Um, if we look closely at the stand, there are two metal staples um, that were used uh, to, to repair this piece. Um, and this was done by drilling two holes on either side of, side of the brake and then uh, putting a metal clamp in there under tension. And I have a, a similar piece here. So this also has lots of these metal staples. Um, so this, this was a way to repair glass and, and ceramics as well um, before there was really an effective adhesive for, for glass. Um, like we, I mentioned earlier with the quilt painting, not a lot of things like to stick to glass and until modern adhesives were readily available, um, this was one way that, that people were able to fix things that were important to them. Did that, does the glass have to be a certain thickness before it can be stapled um, or clamped like that? No, it doesn't mean it's safer for the glass if it's a little thicker. Um, as you can imagine, drilling into a piece of glass um, is a little bit of a risk. <laughs> <laughs> a big risk. <laughs> so we, we d it's definitely not something that we do anymore. Um, but I personally find these historic repairs very interesting. And um, we do actually, like as you can see with this piece and the piece in the gallery, we leave them alone for the most part. Um, if they're not too visually disruptive or um, if they're stable, those are kind of the main issues. Um, it's in some ways it's sort of nice because you know, all right, this piece did not originally have staples right. in it or clamps in it. And you know kind of what the story is. Whereas you look at some of the other pieces and you know, they're iridized now, but you know, that's not the way they were right. originally. And it's sometimes if you don't know those things, you can assume that what you're seeing has always been. Right. Whereas you wouldn't that's do true. that as yeah. much yeah. with yeah. this. You wouldn't think that, no. Um, so th this actually also has adhesive in there. Otherwise you would see the breaks even more. But, um, but it's an interesting testament to the history of the piece. So yes. it was certainly valued by its owner and they want, wanted to preserve it. This is a, a really lovely cut um, piece from, from Bakewell. So it's, it's very important and they wanted to preserve it. So here I have a candlestick that also had these staples in it, but at some point before it came to us, these staples were removed. And um, I'll show the, the bottom of it here. You can see where the staples were and they're kind of pairs. So you can see across this join there was one uh, here, here. And when I repaired this piece, I decided to leave those visible so we can tell that story of the history of the piece on the underside. But on the top, there were a couple of holes as well um, here that were filled uh, to make it less of a, a visual disruptor, disruption to the piece. Can you point to one? Because I can't yeah. see yeah. them. So there's, ah, there's okay. a hole here and there's one here. And unfortunately, the, the fill that, um, the, the material that I used to fill the holes has already yellowed a little bit. So 
And um, when was it repaired? I was supposed to repair it about nine years ago when I first started. So, hmm. Yeah, so that's, that's one of the problems that we have with old repairs is that sometimes they yellow. So some of the materials that we use um, are not as stable as we would like. And this is a piece, I don't know if you can see up here, um, and the whole top has, has completely yellowed. So those were originally when, when, so those are repairs, but when they were originally made, they were clear. But over time, um, they, they've interacted with light and oxygen and yellowed. What are the repairs made from? Are they, they're not glass, are they? So no, um, we, we don't repair uh, our pieces with glass. It's, glass does not like to be reheated, and so that's a very dangerous thing to do. Um, but these are epoxies, um, okay. and those are the ones that, that yellow mostly. So if we see a piece like this, and it's got a significant portion of it that is yellow, we can probably guess that there's been some pear done yes. on it. Okay. Yes. Um, and, you know, so these pieces, we can see the old repairs pretty easily, um, but we don't always see old repairs. And there's a great example up in the galleries, if we can look at the video um, of that now. So here in the European galleries, um, there we find a, a winged goblet um, right here, which came into the lab, and it had no uh, documentation of a previous damage. But something felt a little off, and so we looked at it under UV, and we could see that the, the right side in, um, in this image was actually uh, a repair. And it's a very good repair. <laughs> it almost tricked us. But once we knew it was a repair, we could see kind of the color differences um, and some of the other uh, things uh, about it. If we can go to the, the UV image of that, you can see uh, how, okay. um, how obvious it became that it was a repair. Hmm. So one of the um, reasons we want to know when something is repaired, here we, we see it again. It's a big, big color difference, um, especially. Um, and that's because the glass is fluorescing a little bit differently than the, the plastic that was used to, to make the repair. Okay. Yeah. And so it's really important for us to know uh, when something is repaired because it has uh, a great effect on, on handling. And now Steve will talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so repairs, of, of course, especially with adhesives, have a life expectancy. Uh, sometimes it's 30 years, sometimes it's 40 years for conservation. We like to think of something lasting longer than that, especially for caring for our collections and, um, <clears throat> and having it on display in museums. So we hate to think of the possibility we might have to retreat something every 30 or 40 years. This would be dramatic. And I found <laughs> this piece in storage. And one of the first things you should learn and understand is that have some respect for a piece that's been repaired. And, and I, my general recommendation is always pick it up with two hands from the bottom. Because you may not know that it's an intact piece or not, or, or where it oh. was actually <laughs> not even repaired. So it has a little friend inside here. Wow. But yeah, so this piece was never completed. And in the end, it's, it was really quite a surprise to me because I didn't originally pick this one up with both hands from the bottom. I actually picked it up from the neck. And to my surprise, <laughs> no, so it was <laughs> not even repaired. So you can see that there's some, some repairs. This was a piece obviously in progress and just it was never finished. So we do have respect for pieces that were previously repaired because the adhesives, as they yellow, they may get weaker. They may start to separate from the glass. And we have had actually pieces that have had the repairs fall off. So that's a scary issue. Here's one that Astrid will talk about. Yeah, so actually most of the, um, the repairs, or many of the repairs that we do are actually retreating old repairs. So this is one that came into the collection recently um, where there was a repair and the adhesive failed and now we have to redo it. So. so that kind of wraps it up about the old repairs. I don't know if we, you have any more questions, oh, Troy? Um, I, I I'm assuming the bird wasn't original to the piece. Correct. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks. I just thought, you know, you never know. You've got to ask these things because, you know, um. I've learned not to assume anything at this museum. So, yeah. um, 
And the bird makes a nice segue to this piece that Leanne is going to uh, speak to. It's not feathers, but it is fur. Actually, um, I will take us up to the contemporary art and design yeah, gallery. Yeah, you want to start there? Yes. Okay. Um, so in the overall view of this gallery, we can see the, the scale of the individual artworks. Unlike most of the glass in the museum collection, the contemporary glass tends to be rather large and often incorporates non-glass elements. This piece in particular, Coronia by Javier Perez, is a visitor favorite and a great contrast to the pieces we've seen so far. In this piece, we see taxidermied crows on a fallen chandelier, and the combination of objects we know, like crows and chandeliers, out of their usual context, makes this piece really interesting to look at and think about. So did you plan that transition with the bird and the other piece? Because that's really smooth. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's pretty I'll, awesome. I'll OK. Yeah. All right, well done. <laughs> Go ahead. All right. So as I just said, I think um, one of the real challenges with contemporary art is the mixture of materials. And the reason this, I think this is a little challenging to us here at the museum is because we're trained in one type of one type of conservation. So that would be like paintings and paper, and in my case, objects. And at this museum, <laughs> we have the real luxury of working with a lot of glass. Surprise. So, <laughs> um, so when I see something like this, um, with rabbit fur and uh, mirrored glass, there are, there are a lot of things that come to mind. Um, the mixture of materials, so like for example, I wouldn't the way I would treat this object is a little bit different from, say, you know, a, st a historic piece. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't wash it, for example. Um, Rabbits don't like that. No, <laughs> not this rabbit. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, a lot of these, I think this piece also, like we were just talking about, has a previous repair on the little tail there, underneath. So you can see that little brown, kind of join line. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Directly below the silvered part? Yes. Uh, that is, that's from aged adhesive. So the aged adhesive will turn, <laughs> will discolor. I think it was initially clear. And uh, it'll become brittle. So hmm. when we're handling this kind of object, too, I think some of these other pieces are also um, put together with adhesive. So that's, that's something that we would Yeah, so even though we don't on. know for sure, because we see that there, then we're going to be extra cautious with exactly. the other parts of it. OK. Exactly. And even the, that previous repair, I think, has yellowed since it was done. But okay. that was like 30 or so years ago. OK. So that's, that's the date on the original. Uh, the this original is a 1976 production. piece, okay. but I think it was repaired in the 90s. OK. So it's Seven title? This is Trophy. Trophy. Jon Sontag. Thank you, Astrid. <laughs> Jon Sontag. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to talk about two. Another, another concern with contemporary glass is a lot of artists are experimenting with different glass compositions. So Atelier NL is doing this project where uh, people from around the world submit sand, local sand, and it's melted into glass. So you can kind of see on this card below it. I know it's tiny, but the different imperfections or you know additives depending on the location will give a different color. So all of those different colors represent sand from different places. Exactly. They're all sand, but they're from different locations. Exactly. Okay. And so the difference between those things it, it gives it a really unique yeah. character. And so we're not really sure how this will you know this will age, but we're excited to find out. So does the vial <laughs> have the original, that's the original yes. color of the sand that's there? Yes, turn okay. this around. And it, it actually says where it's from in oh, there, too. Oh, that's really kind of cool. It's a really cool piece. So this is just one of many. But okay. I've got a couple of questions. Um, so ages ago, as a preparator, we saw a transition from glass artists to artists working in glass who might not have the same understanding of the material some glues would fail over time. Has that continued and presented challenges for conservation? Yes. And um, I think we don't necessarily know at the time that we're using something whether, you know, how it's going to age definitively. I mean, you can see with that repair, the staple repair, um, it's discolored in nine years. And that's, an, that's a resin we thought was pretty stable. Hmm. So, I mean, we're using the best materials to the best of our knowledge. But, you know, 
I think um, the same might apply to artists as well. Yeah, I right. could see that. I mean, yeah. in some ways, this piece is about process here, mm -hmm. you know, kind of thinking about all the different possibilities that a, a material we think of as one thing, sand, right. presents to an artist as a tool. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. And it's also that uh, a lot of artists don't have training in how to use adhesives or what adhesives are the best to use for glass. And actually, the advent of the studio movement has, has complicated this dramatically because people with making their own glass and glass is getting larger, people are making them out of sections and gluing them together. And they sometimes just go to the hardware store and they'll pick up a five minute epoxy. Mm -hmm. It's probably the worst adhesive there is or they'll pick up Gorilla Glue or something that just really is not appropriate for glass. So we're trying to do our best in educating not only uh, the public, the studio, but uh, glass people who are conservators or students who will end up doing some kind of glass repairs, what the best materials are to use. I've always been kind of amazed at what glass or people who work with glass have as a learning curve in terms of materials where you have to learn to control a variety of variables at any given time. In addition to knowing kind of how a material is going to change with heat or with light or mm -hmm. any number of other things and then right. add to that, you know, now you have to have a knowledge of epoxy and, and you know, joinery, you know, for your piece as well. So yeah. my artists have their work cut out for them. <laughs> um, okay. I don't know how much time we have left, but I do have a couple of more questions. Um, Will Vaseline glass lose color over time? And you might want to define Vaseline glass for those who may not know. Yeah, what it so is. Vaseline glass is a, a general category of glass that has uranium in it. And uranium was a very pop popular colorant um, after uranium was discovered, of course. And it uh, does turn the glass a very bright, usually green or yellow or orange, very popular between the wars, and then as, as uranium became more difficult to obtain and it was controlled substance, um, it was no longer available to artists. They still can get it as depleted uranium and it still gives the same effect in glasses. But as far as I know, there's no color change over time. Okay. We have some pieces in the collection and they're actually not even harmful because the amount of uranium that's in them is so low that they're, they're not a risk at all. And even if you, and if you put them in a case, you can't even measure the, the, the um, output of radiation from, exterior, from outside the case. Okay. And what's the recommended way to clean delicate glass surfaces like these in our personal collections? What can we, can, what can we do to preserve glass that is weeping? Um. Well, weeping glass, that's a, a whole other topic uh, that we haven't really talked about, but that's <coughs> actually, <coughs> excuse me, um, deterioration of the glass itself. Um, the best thing for that is to wash it with water um, and a mild detergent and then rinse it with uh, deionized water or distilled water. That'll get rid of any of the hard water spots that you might, might get otherwise. Um, <coughs> We may do a we may do a, a live stream. Well, on I was cleaning. just thinking yes. we've come up with a few topics for the future. Yeah, we have a few this. more topics for the future. Certainly, one is cleaning. It's a complicated subject. We have some blogs on the on our website already about cleaning. Uh, one on cleaning Pyrex and another in general one on on cleaning. Um, and it's a complicated subject. Both those sub topics are quite complicated. We could probably do a whole session on on crisling or weeping glass. And we probably will. Yeah, we probably will. as we're thinking about contemporary glass, maybe something on epoxies and kind sure. of how do we join pieces together in the future. Certainly yeah. adhesives, yeah. yeah. Yeah, adhesives, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <coughs> but I was going to mention, yeah. so other surfaces, um, Steve talked a little bit about how to clean these surfaces, um, these sensitive surfaces that we mentioned. We don't use water, um, but we might wipe things down with a damp cloth where there is no uh, pigment that can be removed. Um, th but surfaces that are just acid etched without pigment, those you can actually wash. It that actually leads to a question uh, that we've been getting from quite a few of our viewers, which is what are the kind of adhesives that are best for fixing glass? 
And I would actually add for my own kind of curiosity, <laughs> who does the fixing? <laughs> not every piece has a concert, not every person has access to a conservation right. department, but you know, is it the, some, are any of these things that you would advise them doing at home or would you prefer they go to a professional conservator? In general, my recommendation is do not try this at home. <laughs> um, gluing glass together, repairing glass is one of the most difficult um, jobs there is. You can, most people can do ceramics and do a fairly decent job, but glass is, is unique. The breaks are very sharp. They're, they need to be really tight joins to put them together properly. Otherwise, you're going to have uh, things out of alignment. Uh, the adhesives we use are tricky. They require considerable experience, and I mean considerable experience. They've both been you know, working as students long before they came to take a job. Uh, we all did. Uh, multiple years of experience working with whatever adhesive you want. Epoxies were very popular. They're still very popular for repairing glass because they're optically clear. They don't leave air bubbles behind for, in most cases, but they're really difficult to use. And they do age badly. Uh, we know that. So we've been switching to using an acrylic adhesive that we actually make up ourselves. It's, it's been published. Um, it's, it is available to the conservation community. It's not so available to the general public, but it's an acrylic adhesive similar to the type of, type of acrylic that's used in plexiglass, which, which is most people are familiar with, doesn't tend to yellow for a really, really long period of time. We're also thinking of the future because we've been having significant trouble with with some of the epoxies, we may go back to trying another adhesive that people had used in the past, which is a polyester resin. Uh, so there are multiple things. But uh, so those are only three out of maybe a hundred that might be available at your at your hardware store. Stay away from most of those. Okay. They're really not going to do a good job for you. They won't stick well to glass, and you'll end up with a worse result than you had in the beginning. And you, did you say you you've done some research on this, and is it published anywhere? It is, it is. And so our website is a, a first place to look. Uh, we have a lot of references on our website, um, as well and as um, some book. information on this. And I have a book. Uh, we've published a book here uh, jointly with uh, Archetype Publications and the Corning Museum of Glass. It specifically t discusses glass objects. <laughs> so that's why the title is has objects in it. Um, it's the classic expression, we don't do windows. <laughs> um, so we leave, uh, we leave flat glass to the gla flat glass experts. So stained glass people or uh, even photographic uh, con conservators uh, using, working with glass uh, would probably have a different type of setup than we do. Uh, but we'll address this again, hopefully in a live stream in the future. Well, great. And Any <coughs> last words? Yeah. Leanne and I are also working on a blog post about what to do when you break glass. So um, look out for that, and that might give um, you guys a better idea of what to do if you break something. <laughs> yeah, and it, those blogs from this department are always really intriguing to me. <laughs> so, Well, thank you all for your time and expertise, and I've learned a lot. I hope our visitors, uh, viewers have too. So we'll hope to see you on the next live stream that we do from our conservation lab.